right. Good morning, everybody. It is great to see you guys. Thanks so much for being here. We're going to be kicking off a brand new series entitled Love One Another. Uh, probably the best way to kick it off, to kind of explain the why behind the series, is to share something that was published about a year ago, May of 2023. The U.S. Surgeon General came out with an advisory that basically said, if, uh, because uh, COVID-19 was effectively over with, now there's a new epidemic that nobody seems to be talking about. And here it is. It's the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. And it is wreaking havoc on our country, in our communities, even in our churches all across the nation. And it's stuff that maybe we've, you know, as we talk about it, we may say, well, we should have known better, but we have not done better. And so this is my hope that as we understand what this is doing to us, we can make steps to understand what does God say to do about this? What, what are the steps forward? But uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General, he basically said, through this uh, advisory, 80 pages of scientific research, he says, this isn't something that just happened overnight. One in two adults in America were already feeling these deep feelings of loneliness even prior to the 2020 pandemic. As, as a matter of fact, over the past 50 years, people have been increasingly, here in this country, increasingly experiencing feelings of being isolated, invisible, and insignificant by their own admission. Like people are saying, and, and this cuts across every generational uh, break that we have. Even our younger adult generations like the millennials and Gen Z, the research is showing that even millennials and Gen Z, their time spent with friends has decreased by 70% over the last two decades. And this is having a critical detrimental effect on these generations. As a matter of fact, Gen Z, um, currently 25% of Gen Z is clinically depressed. This is one in four of these young adults, clinically depressed. And this really hits home for me. I'm a dad of three girls. All three of them are in Gen Z, all right? And, and this is a huge deal. And what he goes on to say, Dr. Murthy says that Gen Z also has the highest rate of suicide of any other generation in history. And he says, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of what it's beginning to do to us as a society. That the lack of relational skills is, le is leading to mental health issues with an increased levels of, and I'm sure you've he heard about this, anxiety, depression, and stress, all three of which erode people's ability to be resilient, to bounce back after going through something hard like a pandemic. <laughs> It makes it really hard. People just don't feel as strong. They don't feel as connected. They don't feel like they can take on the challenges of life. Therefore, they feel beaten down all the time. And there's also physical health risks. And, and, and this is really interesting to go back. That also, those three, the anxiety, depression, and stress, are the number one predictors of uh, attempted suicide. And so, so it's just mind-boggling what it's doing to us. Also, it, um, this isolation, social isolation, is causing all kinds of physical health risks, like things like heart disease and dementia and diabetes and premature death. Let me talk about that for a second. This lack of connection in our society, when it comes to like heart disease and high blood pressure, it increases it by 30%, the risk of heart disease and high blood pressure. Dementia goes up by 50%. And even diabetes has now been linked to social isolation. Isn't that crazy? And even this, uh, probably the most alarming of the, th uh, of the four, premature death, the lack of social connection increases premature death to the levels comparable of smoking 15 cigarettes a day or having six alcoholic beverages a day every single day, how that would cut down your longevity. This is what this lack of social connection is doing to us. Therefore, the Surgeon General comes down to this conclusion saying, listen, we, as a, as a human race, we were wired for social connection. 
You can't get away from this. We optimize our, our experience. The human experience goes way up. We, you, we are, you do so much better when you're connected. Therefore, it improves when you're connected. It improves your, so, your personal health and our societal health. Our, our, our health as a community, as a church, as a nation, as a state, it goes up as we are connected. This is why we are talking about this series, Love One Another, the Secrets of, to Sustained Healthy Relationships when we're talking about this. As a matter of fact, some of you may be saying, I didn't need the Surgeon General to tell me this. I already knew this is an issue in our country. As a matter of fact, if you're a Christ-following person, you have read the Bible at all, you probably have come across this teaching in Scripture, both Old and New Testament, that we were made for this, right? As a matter of fact, as we begin to look at the uh, Scripture, and in just a minute we're gonna do that, to kind of lay a foundation of how and why we were made the way we were made, uh, it's so powerful that we see that the oldest human problem and the first one recorded in the Bible, even before sin, is this issue. Now, we're gonna dive into that in just a minute. Before we do, I wanna give a little quick background because scripture talks about that from the very beginning, Genesis chapter one, that God, when he began to create and if you uh, have your notes and you'd like to uh, doodle, let's doodle together, okay? Here we go. We're gonna put God here in the middle, right? So when God begins to create, what we see him do over and over is he's taking chaos and he's turning it into order. Right? Every time... He's taking chaos, turning it into order, and when he does, the first five days of creation, he says, and it is good, right? It's good, and what is implied here is that the chaos, before he brings order to it, is not good. It's not good for human flourishing. It's not good for you and me. And that, that he's bringing order to it in order for us to be able to optimize, to be able to have a relationship with him and with each other that is at its very best. And so this is what God continues to do throughout the creation process. And it's really powerful. And um, we see this uh, happening um, for the first five days. And then on the sixth day, we have the first creative brainstorming session of all time, okay? So you, you guys that like that, you'll like this. Uh, Genesis chapter one, verse 26, we see this. Then God said, then let's read the highlighted words together. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. That's right, so the big question is, who's us? Who's our, right? And what we understand, what we discover here, and this is unpacked later in Scripture, is that God is Trinity. He is a triunity. He's not three gods. He's one God and three persons. So the best way to begin to understand God is, I'm going to overlap here a little bit. Boom. Okay. Wow, that looks way better than the last service. Okay. <laughs> Father, Son, Spirit. All right, that God is made up of these three persons and this is who he is. That he is, the, as the um, great um, philosopher Dallas Willard would say, a sweet society of love. That's who God is within himself. He is this beautiful society of love. He's a community. And so we see right here that God says, I am gonna make humankind in my image to mirror me, to be like me. This is so important to keep that in mind because every time we veer away from this primary idea from creation, we get ourselves in trouble, we drift into chaos. That God didn't just make us 
to be like him. He made us to know him, and as we know and love God, it unlocks for us this possibility of becoming like him. We will want to be like him. It's not keeping rules. It is an adoration and a love and a kindness and and a compassion that we're drawn to in God. It is a freedom in it that the more we become like him, the more we go, oh, wow, this is who I was meant to be. This is what I was created to do and to be. The more I become like him, but the more I run from him, the more there is pain and chaos, and it's not good, just as he says. So, there is this this problem that sneaks in in chapter two, like the second page of the Bible, we see this problem begin to sneak in, and here it is, chapter two, verse 18, the Lord said, the Lord said, it is, let's say it together, it is, it's not good for the man to be what? Alone, that's right, so we can put alone right here. It's not good for man to be alone. So, he's saying, listen, this is is an issue that needs to be addressed. In other words, the first problem of humanity wasn't sin, it was isolation. It was the first one that God says, I've got to address this. This this has got to be taken care of. This has got to be fixed. And so, we see what's interesting is that even today, in the most cutting edge um, psychology, which is just simply the study of the human behavior, What we understand from psychology is aligning with exactly what God has said all along, which is really interesting. One of the longest running psychological studies of all time, it's on human happiness, and it essentially asks this basic question. What is a good, what is a good life? What what does that look like? What does it require? And this study started back at Harvard University back in 1938. It is an 86-year-old study and still going on. It's had four different stewards. The most current one is Dr. Robert Waldinger, who recently did a, uh, a TED Talk, and he shares, listen, one of the greatest overall findings after 86 years that I could share with you is this. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at the age of 50 were the healthiest at age 80. Now just think about that for a second. He didn't say the people who had the best diet, praise God, right? (laughs) Or the people who were the most fit, right? Praise God. Or the people who had made the most money or the most successful. The people with the healthiest, most satisfying relationships at 50. This hits close to home because I'm in my 50s right now, right? This is a huge predictor of longevity. In other words, what the research seems to support over and over is what God said in the first place was that positive relationships keep us happier, healthier, and help us to live longer. Relationships, they take work. They're not easy. They don't happen overnight. They take an investment. You gotta put up with some stuff, don't you? Everybody does. Everybody does. So going back to the issue with Adam, this is chapter two, verse 20, Genesis. But for Adam, no, let's say it together, no suitable helper was found. God let Adam name all the animals. He hangs out with a chimpanzee and a giraffe and a dog and a donkey and a snake, and he's like, these are all beautiful, but they can't be my best friend, right? And some of you may say, well, my dog is mine, (laughs) right? But... Let's be honest, it's hard to get good counsel from your dog. Anyway, um, and if you are, you might need to get help. Anyway, so, but what this means, suitable helper means is, it means equal, someone who is his equal. So God creates an equal partner for Adam. He creates woman. He creates Eve. 
to share the burdens of life, that they can do it together, that they can do the work that God had given them together. In other words, purpose and meaning in life can be infused in both of them equally, and that they do it together, and they shoulder it together, and they can bond as they do this, and they grow closer to God and each other, and there's this beautiful triangle that as they get closer to God, they get closer to each other, and that's the way it ought to work. It's the way God works. It's the way he's made us to function. But what's interesting is that Uh, We forget this. We forget the fact that humanity was designed for community and by a community. A sweet society of love. We were created by that community for community. This is where we function best. We were made in the image of a triune God, a loving community within himself. He created us to image him And what's interesting, what flowed out of Adam and Eve is a family, right? So therefore, God shows us the family has become the original model for community. This is how it ought to work. And what's interesting is that right down to this day, again, cutting edge, psychological perspective, psychological studies that have been done over and over and over show us that a healthy family is the optimal environment for human development period, full stop. That's it. There is nothing that trumps that. There's nothing that's greater than that. Crazy, isn't it? God had it right all I mean, we, what he said is the way we're wired. We see this over and over, but there's a problem in this country. Then maybe you've run into it, maybe you've experienced it personally, and that is that one in four adults in America is estranged from their family. They don't talk anymore. The relationship is strained, it's broken, it's not good. They're not connected, there's not love there. This is it's not optimal, it's not working in a healthy way like it should. And this, this one thing has had a detrimental impact on our country. There was one study that was done at Cornell University that said that this is reshaping our culture to such a huge degree. People are more willing than ever to divorce in their marriages. They're more willing to detach and disengage even from their close, closest friendships. Rather than fight for the relationship, they'll fight with it and they'll, they'll walk away quickly and easily. They don't want to reconcile. I don't want to mend the relationship. I want to walk away. I want what I want and I want to do it the way I want to do it. And we get lonelier and lonelier and more and more isolated. And it is having a ravaging, detrimental effect on us as people. But as we get to the New Testament, we take this teaching and, and look at it through the lens of what Jesus taught, what he said. In the New Testament, all of the language that describes our relationship with each other as Christ followers, all of it references the family. It is familial, over and over and over, that we are adopted as God's children into his eternal family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Where does that come from? It comes from Jesus. There was a beautiful moment that's recorded in multiple gospels, but I want to take a look in Matthew chapter 12, this one of the four biographies of the life of Jesus, where Jesus is teaching his disciples, and somebody comes to him and says, hey, Jesus, um, your mother and brothers are standing outside and wanting to speak to you. And he replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then, check this out, pointing to his disciples. Those of you who consider yourself followers of Jesus, he would have pointed to you. He would have pointed to me. He said, here, here, right here, right here in the room, here. Here is my mother and my brothers. And and, and in Mark chapter 3, verse 35, he takes it a step further. He says, and Jesus then said, whoever does the will of my father, that is my brother my sister, and my mother. That's my family. And he wasn't trying to, you know, reject his family. He wasn't saying, you should go around and just be mean to your family if you're a Christian and they're not. That's not what was happening here. He was just reinforcing that if you're in the family of God, you're a part of the kingdom of God, and we are family members, there should be a heavy-duty, deep, 
friendship and connection and commitment to each other. And it, it should go so far is that we would be willing to make major sacrifices for each other. There's another time right before the cross, right before his crucifixion in John chapter 15 where he teaches on a little, a little heavier, deeper level, what does it mean to love one another? This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way. The same way what? The same way I have loved you. What, what you've seen me do and what you're about to see me do, right? That kind of sacrifice, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for who? Let's say it together. For one's friends, Right? Those, and he's talking to those that were his followers. These were his disciples. These were members of the family of God. And, and so over the next several weeks in this series, Love One Another, we're gonna be unpacking what does it look like, practically speaking, in some of the more difficult, complicated, um, entangled <laughs> relationships. How do we love one another when it's tough, when it's challenging? When it's difficult, we're going to talk honestly and openly about the things that are fighting against us in our culture to keep from loving one another. We're going to be unpacking that over the next several weeks. But as adults, there is a sober reality that we have to come to terms with, and that is if we're going to cultivate meaningful, life-giving relationships with other people, it has to be intentional, and it's going to cost us some time. It's going to co cost us some energy and some effort. We're going to have to invest. We're going to have to be uh, really willing to sacrifice to make that happen. Or else, what will happen is what happens to most people. There's a default setting that most people will fall into of the relationships of your life just being not sufficient, but efficient. It's just efficient. It's just, it's convenient, right? And most adult relationships, if we're honest, fall into one of these three categories. It's practical in other words, it's convenient. Like, I'm going to see him anyway, right? This is the person that cuts my hair, checks me out at the grocery store. I see him at the gas station or I see him in the neighborhood. And it's just kind of quick. It's pretty shallow. It's, you're not really getting a lot out of it. They're not getting a lot out of it. So you can't ever really expect it to sustain you through hard times because you haven't really put much into it. Or maybe it's just functional, these are traffic patterns of life. These are the people that you're going to see at your kid's sports thing, you know. You're going to see them. And nothing wrong with these folks. But generally speaking, these are not the kind of people where you have deeper, meaningful, highly committed relationships where they got your back, you've got theirs. You can call them at 3 a.m. in the morning when a crisis hits and you know they are down to help and they love you and they care about you, they're praying for you and you are doing the same for them. Those are hard to find these days. Or they're transactional. You do business with them. So you hang out with them. So we, this is the people that you do play golf with, have lunch with. And again, it's just convenient. It's not really that meaningful. In other words, and this is a great question to ask as we go forward. How much, if you personally, how much have you settled for efficient relationships that are not sufficient? It's time to begin to make sufficient relationships a priority it is so powerful to begin to say i'm going to i'm going to really make the time to invest in relationships with other people who are seeking god they don't get it right all the time but we can be mutual beneficial kind of encouragement prayer partners to be able to speak truth to each other we give permission to talk to each other and we, we, we begin to do that. And I, I want to just share, this is so powerful that happens when we begin to do this. Uh, and maybe you have seen this in your own life, that you've got people in your life where you always say, oh, we should get together. And you mean it, right? Like, we really should get together. I really want to get, I like really want to have some time to sit down and catch up. But then it, it like, oh, I'll do it next week and I'll do it next month and I'll do this. And next becomes never. Let's be honest, it just doesn't happen. And who does it hurt? It hurts you, it hurts them, and the people around you. This week, I wanna encourage you to make it happen. Who is God bringing to mind? What's the name, what's the face? I, need to, I haven't made time and I should. I need to make time for this. In other words, community, community, ladies and gentlemen, is how God creates order out of chaos. So we're gonna put community right down here.
right? Slash family. It becomes our family. It's so powerful. And that's how God breaks this cycle of loneliness and isolation is that we connect with each other. We reach out to God. God, show me who you've already put in my life, and if I don't have anybody, Lord, help me as I seek this. Show me, maybe over the next few weeks, over the next month, maybe there's somebody that I could reach out to, connect with, spend more time with. They're, they're, they're a wealth of knowledge and encouragement that I'm just not tapping into, and it is worth every moment you can carve out to give to that kind of a relationship. We have made them disposable and we are paying the dear price because of it. In other words, I want to encourage you to let God lead you home to his family. Again, not perfect people, but when we come together, there's just a power. When two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. There is a power that comes from his people coming together. And these could be believers that don't even go to this church. That's okay. I meet with believers that don't even go to this church that are not pastors anywhere. They're just men I know will pray for me and they are serious about walking with Jesus and they lift me up. It's awesome. Look for them. They're around. They don't make any fanfare about it. They're not people that are like, look what I'm doing. I'm posting all kinds of pictures. No. That's not who you want to be meeting with. I'm just telling you. It's awesome. They're just doing it and quietly changing the world. Look for those people. They're around. They don't even know they're doing it. And it just, it's, it's so powerful. And let me just say, if you are too busy for these kinds of key relationships in your life to invest in them, then you, please hear me, you are too busy. You're too busy. You need to carve some stuff out of your, your schedule. This must become a priority in your life. Your life depends on it. The quality of your life, I hope if we prove nothing today, we prove the quality of your life, the longevity of your life depends on on this. This is the way God has created you and I. Even if you don't agree with this, if you fight against it, you pay the price. I just encourage you today, would you be open to what God says is true about you and just see if it doesn't work. Maybe you take a step and you just try it to see. you just like, I'm skeptical, but I'm going to try it. I'm telling you, that's an awesome place to be. Let God show you that his wisdom works. It's awesome. Here's the application prayer. I'm asking you to pray with me today. It's simply saying, Lord Jesus, I am tired of fighting the chaos of loneliness and isolation. Please bless my steps towards connecting with other members of your family. I commit my life to you and to your community. This, is a, this could be a hinge point. This could be one of the most powerful commitments that changes everything for you. If you'll take this seriously, begin to put this into practice and make this a priority in your life, it could accelerate your spiritual growth like nothing else. It'll make you go further faster with God and you will be so overjoyed with what God brings through that relationship. If you would, let's bow together in prayer. And as we pray, I want to ask those of you who it's clear that God's put on your heart, it's time to take a step towards community. It's, it's time to take a step away from the chaos and loneliness, the things that are clearly not good. It's not producing anything good in you. And there are others of you that need to begin a relationship with God today to start that, let that uh, sweet society of love, of God's Trinitarian love pour over your heart that you might become a child of God today and become a part of his family and then let him bless you with relationships that reinforce and strengthen that relationship with him. Lord, we come before you right now. We thank you for your love. We thank you, God, that you care so much, so deeply for your people. And part of what we're seeing across our nation and our world today is a drift, a drift away from the way you've created us to function the very best, the most optimal. We're drifting away from what actually works for human flourishing, and we are hurting because of it. Our kids, the next generation, they're hurting because of it. God, help us to, to, to 
to stop this tide, stem the tide, turn it back. God, when we commit today, right here, all across this room, watching online, everybody would say, God, we commit. We're doubling down on our commitment to you and to your family, to the people of God, starting today. If you would make this commitment with me right now, that you would commit to double down in your commitment to the people of God, to community, to these key relationships of others who are seeking after him. Would you just lift your hand with me right now? I'd love to pray for you and your family. God, thank you for every hand going up. Thank you for every person that's saying, yes, God, I want to do my part. I want to connect. God, we, we, we are better together. There is no question about it. The overwhelming avalanche of evidence, biblically, psychologically, sociological, every other way, God, tells us this is the way we were wired as human beings. And God, we are committed to follow your wisdom for the way you've created us. And I pray, God, that you would help us to take a giant step of faith towards you to really build that kind of biblical community in our life and in our world. We're committed to it. You may lower your hands. And God, right now, for any person, your heads bowed, eyes closed, any person that would honestly say, God, I want a relationship with you, if there's a question mark in your heart, you're not sure where you stand with God, would you just pray right where you sit? You're watching this online, pray right where you sit. Lord Jesus, I'm inviting you into my life. I want you to come and take up residence within me, your Holy Spirit. Would you forgive my sin that has kept me from you all these many years? I want to be forgiven. And you tell us that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness when you do that. Ask him to forgive you of your sin and be the Lord and leader of your life. Just ask him, Lord Jesus, right now, I ask you to forgive all my sin. Cleanse me and be the leader of my life from this moment forward. If you just prayed that for the very first time, would you just boldly, I know I'm asking a lot. This is a big uh, step of faith, a bold ask of faith. Would you just lift your hand up high right now saying, Will, I have given my life to Christ. God bless you, ma'am, right there. Anybody else giving my life over to Jesus today? Anybody? I see you right there on the, in the balcony. Anybody else? God, I thank you, Lord. God bless you right over here, buddy. I see you. Anybody else? Father, thank you so much for speaking to the hearts of people. And God, even in our presence right here, that you are including more members into your family. The population of heaven has just expanded. We praise you for that, Lord. You tell us that even the, heaven, the angels in heaven, they break into celebration over just even one lost sinner turning back to you. And I thank you, God for the multiple people today that are turning their hearts to you. And may you help us to take steps, all of us, towards building a stronger, vibrant community of people who love each other, have each other's backs, that are encouraging and taking care of each other. Thank you, Lord, for inviting us into such a beautiful assignment that will make life the best it could possibly be. We pray it all in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you back next week as we continue. Love one another.